people who walk in darkness have seen a great light. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son given. And he will be called. Wonderful Counselor. Dios Todo Poderoso. Everlasting Father. Prince, the Prince of, of Peace. peace. Gloria a Dios en las alturas. Glory to God in the highest. And, and peace, peace to, to his, his people, people on earth. earth. One of the things that I think is always true for us is that every one of us have a name. I know that sounds profound, right? Not really. But every one of us have a name. Now, some of us, we have a long name. Some of us have short names. I, I, I've been in places where people have had more than 30 different names. If you come from a part of the world where the naming ceremony and, and people get to, 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 to speak into your life and name you. Biblically, there were some names where they were prophetic in fashion, where they would declare what their life's purpose was going to be and ultimately where they would end up doing. Names are incredibly important. Sometimes uh, we're named after meaningful people. Sometimes we can be uh, more jovial in a nickname that kind of marks a significant uh, moment or a more lighthearted moment. My daughter's, or my daughter, was recently praying over a meal and she did something at the end of the, the prayer that all of us often do when we pray. We use this common phrase. It is, in the name of Jesus, I pray, amen. I don't think there's a more frequently used phrase in prayer than in the name of Jesus. I also believe there's probably no more misunderstood phrase than that phrase in the name of Jesus. I often wonder, do we really understand all that that phrase invokes and means for us as Christ's followers? Now, in biblical times, uh, a, a, a biblical name would represent their heritage. It could represent their character. It could represent uh, their reputation. It could even represent their profession. Now, bi biblically, we have a God who has chosen to reveal himself through his names. He's called our provider. He's called our healer. He's called our peace. He's called our de deliverer. There's so many different names that describe a different aspect of his character. What if I told you that your trust in God was directly related to your understanding of his names? What if I told you that your capacity to trust God is directly related to your knowledge about his names? This is becoming very real for me uh, in Psalms 91. This is a psalm that I have been thinking about a lot this year as we've been in the middle of a pandemic. It says here in verse 14, it says, Because he has said, he's speaking about David, the leader here, because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. This is what God is saying. I will set him on high because he has known my name. I will set him on high because he has known my name. Think about the incredible spiritual benefits that are promised to David in this scripture just because he knows the name of God. Here's another one. I like this one, Psalms 9, verse 10. It says here, those who know your name trust in you. Your capacity to trust is related to your knowledge about the name. Those who know your name trust in you. Here's another one, Psalms 44. This is a good one. You are my king and my God whose decree, who decrees victories for Jacob. Through you, we push back our enemies. Through your name, we trample our foes. And here's a, I think a famous one that many of us will know is Proverbs 18. That the name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous run into it and they are saved. So the name of the Lord can be a place of refuge. It can be a way by which God protects me and ultimately defeats my enemies. You know, the dictionary, when you think of just this concept of name and the word name, uh, here's the dictionary definition of the word name. It is uh, a word or words by which an entity is designated or distinguished. Let me say that again. Name 
is a word or words by which an entity is designated or distinguished. So by that definition, to understand the name of the Lord is to recognize what distinguishes him. When God is revealing himself in scripture through his name, he is doing so to distinguish himself from all other entities. One of the things that I like about the Christmas season is that we're often in areas where they were walking through uh, a, a, a grocery store or we are in a gas station or we are going about our business often in the background uh, songs are being sung. It's this time of the year where the, the name of Christ is magnified all around the world. One of the most famous uh, portions of scripture that you will hear is Isaiah chapter nine, verse six. And this is where the prophet Isaiah boldly declares in a difficult situation that the nation was facing, the nation of Israel. Uh, they were being assaulted from all different angles and so much turmoil in the leadership of their nation. Isaiah in prophetic fashion announces that a future leader is coming. And he says, here's how you're going to recognize him. And he begins to describe his leadership when he comes and what he's going to do politically, what he's going to do socially, what he's going to do spiritually. And he gives all of these different monikers and titles and names to this child that's going to come. He talks about Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Let me read it to you. He said, for unto us a child is born, to us a son is given. Listen to this. And the government will be upon his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. And here's the one, ready? The Prince of Peace. And we ultimately know that that's speaking about Jesus. He would be the Wonderful Counselor, the Everlasting Father, the Mighty God. But then he would be the Prince of Peace. Can I talk to you? This Christmas season, Stone Creek Church, and those who are listening in our broader audience, can I just talk to you about that last one right there? What does it mean for Jesus to be the Prince of Peace? That's one of his names. That's one of the things that distinguishes him from all other entities is that he is peace and he brings peace. When he's present, peace is present. In fact, listen to these words when he's speaking to the disciples. He's on his way out. He's getting ready to die on a cross and ascend into heaven, be resurrected from a grave, and ultimately be seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Listen to his words here in John 14. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give it to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. What is it mean for Jesus to bring peace? What does that peace look like? How does it operate in our lives? I think one of the things we have to do if we're going to understand the Prince of Peace and understand the peace that Jesus brings, what is that peace? What is it? First of all, the peace of God biblically is this. It is a state of calm and security that we receive from our relationship with Jesus Christ. It is a state of calm and security that we receive because of our relationship with Jesus Christ. Now watch this, that translates into our responses to life circumstances. That's the key part too, that's the second half. It's a state of calm and security that we receive from our relationship with Jesus Christ that translates into our responses to the circumstances of life. The opposite of peace, its opposite in scripture is fear and worry. So if fear and worry are present, that means that God's peace, Jesus' peace that he gives to us is not there. So what I want to do is I wanna just look at one verse. In fact, I want you to turn to that verse with me. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 16. It's in the second half of your Bible, towards the back of your Bible, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 16. Here, one of the early church leaders, the Apostle Paul, um, one of the fathers of the faith, is describing to us how the peace of God is accessed, how the peace of God operates in our life, and ultimately 
um, uh, what distinguishes the peace of God uh, in, in our lives. It's, a, it's an incredible one uh, verse of Scripture that I think is worth looking at as we ponder this Prince of Peace or the Lord of Peace. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 16. It says, now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every situation. And now may the Lord of peace give you peace himself at all times and at all and in all situations. So what are we to learn about the peace that Jesus brings to us from that one simple verse? I think there's just... Three simple thoughts in closing. The first is this. Let me read it to you again. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace. And the word that I'll describe here is, is the, the word intimate. That's it. And I'll, I'll say it like this. His peace cannot be purchased. It cannot be forced. It must be released. It cannot be purchased. It cannot be forced. It must be released into our lives, meaning this. It comes through our proximity to him. It comes through abiding in him. I want you to think of God's peace like an app that's absent on your phone. And the only way you're gonna get the app onto your phone is you have to download it. You have to make a, a connection so that a download can happen. You must download it onto your phone or download it, if you will, into your life. But at first, you must have a deep connection. Uh, when my Often when my kids and I are on a walk, uh, we, or when we go camping, I like to take them uh, walking in the dark. One of the things I like to do is when the flashlight's on, it's, it's interesting how much further away they will get from my presence. They'll run ahead as far as they can see. They'll play in the realm of the light. But then what happens is I like to do this. I like to torture my kids, not really but I'll turn the light off and then we're in the dark. It's pretty funny how quickly I can begin to feel a hand reach out to grab my hand or I can begin to feel a shoulder brush up against me. There's just something about that that, that I love because it's almost as if they're borrowing from my presence a security, a calmness, or if you will, a peace just by increasing their proximity somehow by getting close to me they feel safer, they feel more at peace because somehow being close to me means that dad can handle it. I think that is a concept that's at play here in Matthew eleven twenty-eight, 28, when Jesus is describing the, the nature of his leadership. In Matthew eleven twenty-eight, 28, he says this, uh, come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden or carrying heavy burdens and I will give you rest. Some translations say, and I will give you peace. But notice that, that is, the, the verb there is come to me. In other words, we have to move towards him in order to experience his peace. And now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace. If you want his peace, get close. Second one is this. And now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times. I call this the constancy of Jesus' peace. And you notice that in life, you and I can have all kinds of things that are happenstance, that are indescribable, that seek to disrupt, that can lead to all kinds of unpredictable terms, that can lead to strife and discomfort. And we can be amazed, come on, 2020, where we find ourselves. But I love this verse because it says that at all times, Christ's peace is present for me. I, I think when we find ourselves in all of these circumstances and decisions have to be made and things are unpredictable, your constant companion in every one of those is peace that Jesus brings to you. Here's how Paul put it in another scripture, Colossians 3, 15. And he said, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. That word rule, there's an interesting word. It means to let the peace of Christ judge, let the peace, the, the peace of Christ discern, uh, let the peace of Christ govern your relationship with Christ and others. It's an important thing when you think about the peace of Christ. 
I want to also say this. It's important as a pastor that I say this is that the peace of Christ is an indicator of God's will, but it's not the only indicator of God's will. I think that's important for you to know what I wrote down here. You know, you are where God wants you to be when you are objectively in in, in his word and when you subjectively are experiencing his God given peace. OK, objectively in the word and subjectively in his peace. Now, if you feel like you're subjectively in his peace, but you know you're outside the boundaries of scripture, don't trust that peace. You have to have both of them. You have to have the authority of the word and you also have to have the spirit born kind of peace. I'll say this. Sometimes in our relationship with Christ, when we are drifting away, one of the ways we know we are drifting is our peace will be disrupted. In fact, I'll say it like this. Uh, disobedience leads to disrupted peace. Obedience always leads to restored peace. Di disobedience leads to disruption. Obedience leads to a restored peace. It always brings peace with it. Here's the last one. It says, and now may the Lord of peace him self at, give you peace at all times. Here's the last one. And then every situation. I call this the supremacy of peace. It's not only that this peace that you have, not only will it be at work in you, but it will be in work in the circumstances around you. I think probably the greatest portrait of Jesus being the Prince of Peace is found in Mark chapter four, when Jesus is on the boat asleep with his disciples, they are going from one shore to another and a violent storm is taking place. They're bailing water, the winds, the waves. It's a violent storm. They think they're going down. And in a last stitch effort, they go wake Jesus up. Now, let me just say this. I wish I could sleep like that. In the middle of a storm on a little bitty boat and you asleep. Ooh, man, that's some good sleep in there. They wake Jesus up. And Jesus says, oh, you of little faith. And he stands up in the boat. And here you have the Prince of Peace speaking peace to a storm. And he says these words, peace be still. And the scripture says that the, that the storm grew silent, the waves grow docile. And the scripture says that those around him, the disciples were like, what manner of man is this? They were in awe of him. You know, interestingly about Jesus, not only, watch this, did he possess peace, but he was peace and he is peace. He not only possesses it, but he is peace. You know, let me ask you a question. I'm going to bring it home here. Is where should our world that doesn't have a relationship with Christ, where should the world go? to see a picture of peace? Where should the world go to look to find the peace of Christ? You know where they should be looking? At us, at the church, Stone Creek, and the church universal. I mean, think about it. This is supposed to be the dominating virtue of our lives as individuals and our lives corporately as the body of Christ. We are ruled by peace. We have the peace of God at work and on display. And if you want to see it, then all you have to do is to look at the church. In a pandemic, where do you find peace? Look for the body of Christ where the peace of God is ruling and reigning. Let me bring it one layer down into your home, into my home, into your world, into my world. Let's just say I'm going to be all up in your grill here in the next few moments. Where do your loved ones, your family members, your friends, your teammates, your co-workers, your classmates, the ones that you have a relationship with, where do they go to find peace, to see it? You. They need to see it in you. See, it's one thing for the peace of God to be in you. But it's a whole other thing when it's operating, it'll begin to spill out and bring peace to the situations around you. I love the peace of Christ that he brings. 
In other words, let me say it like this. We must become a portrait of a preferred destination. We must become a portrait of a preferred destination. I want that. Why are you so calm? Why are you so secure? Why do you seem to have so much peace? You know, mankind, humankind will always fail in its attempt to bring peace and to live in peace with themselves and one another when they leave out Jesus Christ. In fact, you can go to the United Nations and the headquarters in New York City on a, one of the walls there, you can read a quote from Isaiah 2, 4, calling for the peace between the nations. As if just writing it on the wall would bring the peace to the world. And we can look around the world and know that our world lacks peace. You know that it has been said that the place in the world with the most monuments to peace is Washington, D.C. On the mall, it seems like after every conflict and every war, we build a new monument to peace. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but I'm saying what it's telling us is that we will always fall short in our attempts to bring peace and to experience peace when we leave out the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ. So what I want to do now is I want to close in a time of prayer. I want to invite you, especially if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you've never experienced a peace with God through the person of Jesus Christ, if you've never experienced the peace of being made whole, to being forgiven of your sins, to being right with God, being able not only to be forgiven of your, your sins, but also to, be forgive, to forgive yourself and also the divine ability to forgive others. If you've never experienced that kind of peace, I'm gonna invite you to experience Jesus Christ and invite him to be Lord of your life because he's the Lord of peace. He alone can bring peace to your soul. Or maybe you're here and you feel like you drifted and your peace is being disrupted and you need to repent and come near again so that you can have and receive the peace of God. Maybe God is speaking to you. You're, you're a lifelong believer. You're, you've been walking with Christ, but you uh, have been fear, filled with fear and worry, and you need again for Christ to establish His peace in you so that you can bring His peace and speak His words into situations around you. Come on, I think all of us can find a way to experience his peace this holiday season. But if we can, let's right where we're at, let's turn our living rooms, let's turn our, our, our cars or wherever we're at into a place to respond, a place of prayer. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. And let's pray. I want you just to begin to pray right where you're at. If you can, Pray in a normal voice or pray in a whisper, but just begin to talk to the Lord. If you need to be saved, say, Jesus, save me. Cleanse me, forgive me. I want your peace. If you've drifted, repent. I turn around. I come near you again, Lord. If you feel heavy laden, you feel the burdens, the pressures, the answer is in three simple words. Come to me. Jesus said he would give you peace if you would draw near. Father, I thank you for Stone Creek Church. I thank you for the audience that's listening today, those that are just joining us. I thank you who watch us around the world. You are the Prince of Peace. There is none like you. You are distinctly distinguished from all the entities because you, you alone can bring true, supernatural, real peace. In fact, you gave it as a gift. So Lord, I pray for those who are asking you to save them for the first time, those that are, uh, that are drawing near again, and those that just need to reestablish the rule of peace in their heart, come by the power of your Holy Spirit and make your peace felt and known in their lives. May it truly rule in our hearts, and may we at Stone Creek be a portrait of what real peace looks like in a community, but also as individuals. May your peace be at work in us 
and through us. And this Christmas season, may we be instruments of peace because we know your name, the Prince of Peace. And because we know your name, we trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, would you just take a moment and click the link provided for you to help us, uh, to help you. Uh, we'd love to give you some uh, resources to help you grow in your relationship with Christ. Also, if you'd like prayer for any reason whatsoever, we truly are a praying church. We'd love to pray for you. And then if you have yet to fill out a connection card, and this is your first, second, or third time joining us, would you do that? It just takes a few moments. It just helps us to find out a little bit more about you and for you to find out a little bit more about us.